All right, this is Arab Talk on KPOO San Francisco, 89.5 FM. This is Arab Talk with Jess and Jamal, and I'm Jess Ghanam. And this is Jamal Dejani. Well, uh, Jamal, I'm happy to let our listeners on Arab Talk know that we are broadcasting uh, you live from uh, Granada in Spain with the marvels of, uh, you know, the the internet and uh, complexities of internet communication. And I'm broadcasting live uh, from studio in San Francisco. We are delighted to be able to do the show in this way. And as I mentioned to you before we went on air, it seems like, Jamal, every time you take one of these trips, something big happens when you leave. And tragically and unfortunately, in the week uh, since we last spoke, there have been three horrific acts of domestic terrorism that have uh, rocked the United States. In in Gilroy, California, we had an act of domestic terror, and it uh, was just announced by the FBI, uh, you know, within the last day that they are now uh, investigating this as an act of domestic terror. It appears that in the Gilroy attack, um, that in fact, you know, there were three people killed and some 25 plus that were were injured. It appears that the gunman was targeting uh, communities of color, Latino, Hispanic communities. Then tragically in El Paso, uh, Texas, uh, a gunman drove, you know, 10 hours into the night from Allen, Texas, all the way to El Paso and commit, committed a horrific act of domestic terrorism, basically gunning down and going after Latino, Hispanic community members at a Walmart. It was horrific carnage. And then a day later... And, and, day, and, and Mexican immigrants. And, sure. and, you know, unfortunately, we know of at least three people were Mexican citizens that were killed and numerous injured, who, by the way, are too afraid... Uh, a number of people have been injured and too afraid to go to the hospital because they're afraid to be, uh, you know, deported and or arrested. So the context, we have a lot to talk about today because on the one hand, we have these grotesque acts of domestic terrorism. And on the other hand, we have Trump and his surrogates actually having the audacity to say that, you know, the, you know, that white supremacy is a hoax and that this really has nothing to do with white supremacy. And uh, we have a lot to talk about, obviously. But I think I want to start the discussion, Jamal, by hearing from you, because we're the only country in the world, the United States, where these consistent, aggressive, grotesque, horrific acts of domestic terrorism with automatic weapons, uh, you know, basically weapons of war are committed against uh, civilians. It's, we're, we're basically the only country in the world where this happens. How is that being portrayed in the media in Europe and in the Arab world? Well, obviously, this is a, a huge news, uh, not only in Europe and the Middle East, but I believe in the entire world. And the advantage of being in Europe, in Spain, is that, uh, as you know, if you watch TV, you get several networks. Right. Uh, unlike in the United States, you know, you can get to watch the news. You can get to watch uh, Al Jazeera. You can get to watch CNN. You get to watch uh, BBC News. You have the French uh, news and, of course, uh, Spain. And, 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 and you could see, and even, of course, CNN International, which, by the way, has a whole different tone right. than, than the local one, because they focus on the impressions of and the public opinion uh, in Europe in particular, both by their uh, journalists and the guests that they interview. So it is, it is shocking. Uh, I wouldn't say, I mean, we know this is not the first time. It is shocking because of the intensity that you had three terror attacks in one week. You had two of them within 24 hours of each other. So obviously it has taken everyone by surprise. 
uh, not only in the United States, and people are wondering. And this is this is actually the the big question. In fact, um, when I post things on my Facebook page, as you know, my Facebook page has more than quarter of a million followers who are from all over the world, and they have a lot of questions. They ask like, you know, how come Americans have so many so so many weapons? Can people in Texas have? They don't know, for example, about the open uh, and carry, you know, right. the laws that you have in states like Texas and New Mexico and, and others, and they are really surprised. So, so uh, the entire world, I, I think now they have a whole different idea about the United States. It's not that they, they didn't experience this, but they are, in a sad way, uh, watching the U.S. as an aggressive society, as an unsafe society. In fact, two countries have issued warnings. Yeah. You know, you know, like we're used to getting warnings from the State Department saying, "Don't go to Lebanon, don't go to Afghanistan, obviously, in other places." But now that you have a couple of countries, maybe the number is higher. But I was like, uh, that they have been issuing warnings to their citizens about visiting. The United States, and here is something uh, actually just a, a simple fact. I think this this was the 250th or 250 uh, 251. No, no, it's 250. Uh, 250. 250 uh, mass shootings uh, in the United States in this year alone, and the year is not over. And if you look at the sampling of 50 countries or so, you know, starting, you know, of course, both Western countries and others. You look at Sweden, you look at this, you look at even Saudi Arabia, and I'm, I'm looking at different Australia, wherever you'll find zero mass shootings. And the United States has 250, followed by the next, the closest country, guess the number, what's the closest country to the 250? I would say the next closest is what, five, six? Three. Oh, three. Three. We dropped from 250 mass shootings to three in India, and then the number goes to 111, and that, of course, includes the attack in New Zealand, which they had, of course, this year one, and then there was an attack in Canada, and, uh, and I think that's it. Yeah, I mean, this is the reality. If you look at 50 countries and more, and, and, and um, there are more, but actually this is, this is a good sampling. The United States has 250 this year. The closest country is three. And then you hear the argument, the stupid argument uh, from, sadly, the president of the United States about video games and others in, uh, you know, in Congress. When you know that in Japan and and Korea, South Korea, they watch more, they they play more video games and have more video games than than in, in the United States, and they have zero mass shootings. Well, here's the that's a good point, Jamal. Here's the other thing about the video games in Korea and Japan. Uh, they did an analysis about violent content of video games, comparing the 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 violence content in the video games in Japan, Korea, and the United States and other countries. And they found that the violent content of the video games in Japan and, and South Korea was significantly higher than the content of the violence in the United States. So this specious, ridiculous argument that it's the video games, because Trump actually said, the, you know, the who pulled the trigger? He said basically it was mental illness and the video game that pulled the trigger. Completely ridiculous. I have breaking news for Donald Trump. Canada has video games and mental health at the same mental health issues at the same rate the United States. They don't have mass murders. Europe, same. So every country has its share of mental health issues or mental health struggles. Every European and most countries have, you know, as we said, have video games. And guess what? They don't have mass murders. So the only difference between Japan, South Korea, Canada, and European countries, and African countries, and Middle Eastern countries is a pure and simple fact that the United States has more guns per capita than any place in the planet. 
the United States has 370 million guns, more guns than uh, uh, people living in the United States. So for Do you know how much how much this account to as far as the world it's 50 percent of, of the, the world guns. Earth. Yeah, that's right. Entire world. So the United States and and when we're talking about that, I think I think the number is closer to 380 million guns. Guns and this, by the way, does not include law enforcement, uh, etc. This is just with civilians. And and these are the ones that we know about, not even the ones we don't know about. And this is half of all the guns in the, in world. the entire world. I so, mean, is this crazy or what? And then you have these politicians who are in denial, in denial. And you have this toxic NRA, which is in denial. They like to make all kinds of stories, mental health, video games, uh, guns don't kill people, slogan, people kill people, and whatever, things like this. They, they will go everywhere to deny two factors that we are facing now, the, the crazy amount of guns and semi-automatic weapons and assault rifles and guns that should only belong with law enforcement and the military, and two, the danger of white supremacy in this country when you have people like on Fox News, like Carlson saying that uh, it's a hoax. So let's, white supremacy doesn't exist. So let's let's break down each of those issues, Jamal. So I, I want to talk a little bit about the Dayton um, attack, because if you listen to the really crazy rhetoric uh, about the Dayton attack, they will say, well, we we killed the gunman and neutralized the gunman within 24 seconds of the first shot. Well, within 24 seconds, he had managed to to uh, unload over 100 rounds of ammunition, killing nine people and injuring, you know, dozens more in 24 seconds, Jamal. In 24 to 26 seconds, he managed to brutally murder uh, nine human beings, by the way, including his sister, and injuring far more. So the the crazy idea that somehow, and this is the other thing that's being promoted uh, by Sean Hannity, because the NRA and Sean Hannity and the Republican answer to this, as you know, Jamal, is more guns. That we but need they to. Create, they want to create a police state. Yeah, we right? need we need to have more guns. You know, more guns are not going to stop an individual with a semi-automatic or an automatic weapon, even if you get to that person in 10 seconds they will be able to unload 100 rounds or approximately that much in, you know, 15 to 20 seconds and be able to kill, massacre, maim, you know, scores of human beings. So the, the rhetoric about, you know, if everybody had a gun, then we would be able to neutralize this is, is a ridiculous uh, comment. They know that there's a scientific correlation, Jamal. It's a very interesting, straightforward correlation. The greater- well, I, mean, I mean, I mean, it doesn't make sense. Look, someone just walks in Walmart during shopping hours. Even if you, ha if you didn't have a one hour of training and then you open a machine gun or a semi-automatic -automa weapon, like you said, you're gonna gun down you know, dozens of people in in few seconds. Imagine if you go to a mall. Imagine if you go to a a game. A you sporting know, event. A, an event. I mean, so what they're suggesting is to put a policeman at every corner, and arm teachers, as they were saying when we had uh, the attacks in schools and so forth. Well, and they just want to say anything but say, well, maybe we should reduce the number of weapons. Maybe also we should monitor these uh, terrorists because this is what they are. White supremacy is terrorism, and I want to talk about. We'll get uh, to that in a minute. Go but back to talk about this cards and what and what he said. But I want to get. We we will get to that. I just want to drill deep into this, this a little bit because uh, actually Sean Hannity and the NRA and the Republican many people, not all, you know, to their credit, are saying that the answer to the these mass murders and these acts of domestic terrorism is more guns. Sean Hannity says we need to have 
uh, armed guards at every shopping mall, at every movie theater, and here's the kicker, Jamal, at every school in the United States. Not just every school, but every school in the perimeter, on every floor of the school. The idea being more guns will mean a safer society. And what we know from just basic common sense language and science, more guns equals more mass murders. More guns means more access to domestic white supremacists uh, will have access to guns to commit more acts of terror. It's a very simple equation. And no other society, no other country on the planet has such easy access to guns and they don't have the same mass murders by far. As you said, Jamal, the next, the next country after the United States, 250, the next was three. And what, three. Con what country and was then that? One. Then what? the number drops to one for three countries and then the number is zero for the rest of the world. Right. So I guess India was number two with 1.3 billion people in it, and it had three. And then after that, one in New Zealand and one in Canada, and that was it. The argument doesn't make sense. Um, they can't even pass Jamal because we know that there is a loophole around background checks that if you buy a gun from a pri in a private, uh, you know, in a private sale from someone, or you go to the gun show, it's the gun show loophole. You can buy as many guns as you want, and you don't have to go through the background checks. So the fact that we can't even get our act together that the NRA and the Republican Party actually have a noose around the necks of the people of the United States, putting every single American citizen, Jamal, at danger and jeopardy for their lives. Because we can't even get an agreement that to buy a gun, because no one's saying don't have guns. People are saying, if you want to get a gun, you got to get a background check. If you want to get a gun, you got to get a license. You know, we have licenses to get cars, but somehow an 18-year-old, and in some states a 16-year-old, can get a gun and you know not have a background check and not have a license. So that's kind of where we're at, Jamal. You know, these white supremacists are terrorizing the entire country. 94% of the American population believes in a background check law. Yet the Republicans, Donald Trump, the NRI, cannot get it together to give even that small uh, that inch, yet 94% of Americans are in agreement that we need to do that. And here's a trivia. You know when was the last time the NRA actually was for gun control? I have no... I bet a lot, I bet a lot of people don't know because, because the NRA basically does not support any type of gun control. I mean, including... The whatever the bump stocks that you had to right. twist their arms was and that, do all kinds of crazy things. Okay, I think I know the answer. Okay. R Reagan. Okay, that you're close, but why? When and why? Well, I think it was after Reagan was shot, and then it was maybe under Clinton that they kind of there was some sort of pressure that happened because it was under Clinton that they were able to get the temporary ban on assault rifles, but that was only a temporary ban. Did I, did I win? You, no, you straight, you started, you started uh, on the right track. And then I lost. But this, okay. but this was when Reagan was governor and not president. Oh, governor that's right. California. Yeah. And this is when the Black Panthers oh, that's were right. armed. When the Black Panthers were appearing, you know, armed, protecting their homes and wherever, then they basically, California, passed the law that you cannot have the open carry because we were just like, we were part of the wild, wild west where you can actually walk around with a shotgun in your car uh, or in the street. But right. and, until the Black Panthers became powerful and visible, and then they passed basically to retaliate against the Black Panthers and to, to, to disarm them and charge them uh, you know, uh, basically convict them for carrying weapons outside their uh, uh, domicile, Reagan signed that law. So this is, and it was supported by the NRA. And that's why California, basically, that was the first step of, of passing. And that was the only time they supported it. And the reason was 
the reason behind it was pure political because they saw they were threatened by African Americans carrying weapons. So Jamal, it's not a mental health problem, although we need more mental health. It's not a video game problem by far. So it seems like the what the republic what what really is is on the table here is the question of access to automatic weapons and guns by white supremacists and I think we need to drill down. Now on Arab Talk we've been talking about the problems of white supremacy for decades. And I remember when we were talking about this many years ago you and I we took a lot of heat or a lot of criticism for putting ourselves using such strong language uh, on the on the issues of white supremacy. And you know, the, the history of white supremacy goes way back to, you know, the slave trade in the United States when when when, you know, white men were buying black slaves, bringing them into this country and started the slave trade. I mean, and, it, and then it goes all the way forward to the current day. It all of a sudden now, Jamal, it does seem, and I'm including the FBI here, so Christopher Wray, the head of the FBI, the Trump-appointed director of the FBI, says that the greatest threat to the United States regarding terrorism is not ISIS, is not Al-Qaeda, is not international, but the greatest terrorist threat to the United States right now is do white supremacy-dominated domestic terrorism, full stop. Full stop. But I have, but I have news for you. They yeah. say that that's a hoax. They say that's a hoax. And Tucker Carlson said, and I'm actually, he he doesn't think that white supremacy is a problem. Period in the United States. What he says, it's actually not a real problem in America. The combined membership of every white supremacist organization in this country would be able to fit inside of a college football stadium, like as if now he conducted a census about white supremacists, or as if white supremacists walk around every single one of them in the street and say, I'm a white supremacist, or I am a KKK, you know. So, so, so then he said, this is a hoax, just like the Russia hoax, it's a conspiracy theory used to divide the country and keep a hold on power. Incidentally, he's on vacation, he has taken a hiatus. I don't know. I mean, they, they didn't announce why. I hope it's a long, long vacation or a permanent one because he should not be on the air. Well, this it is, he's, he, he is essentially a mouthpiece and a shill for white supremacists for him to even say that. The manifesto written by the white supremacists in El Paso was full of white supremacy rhetoric and rhetoric that was reminiscent of some of the things you would hear at Trump rallies. He talked about an invasion of the United States by, you know, communities of color from Mexico and Latin America. I mean, um, I guess Tucker Carlson doesn't believe what the FBI says. I guess Tucker Carlson doesn't believe what the data says and what we're hearing from you know, basically every single person who's studying this. And I have news for Tucker Carlson. You know, when the 9-11 attacks occurred, it was basically 11 hijackers that, that created the biggest mass terror uh, assault on this country that we know of. That was 11. So just because the white supremacists in this country can fit into a stadium, some stadiums, Jamal, hold over 100,000 people. So what's that got not, to... Not, not, not even that, you know, simply counting members of white nationalist groups really uh, understates the actual threat. Look, you had, uh, they, these are the white supremacist mass killers, like the one who attacked a black church in Charleston, a synagogue in Pittsburgh, and the heavily Latino group of Walmart uh, uh, patrons in El Paso. Had, they are all are not car-carrying members of white supremacy. I mean, how do you identify them as such? It's a so, ridiculous. It's a ridiculous argument. But here's the know, here's the thing, though. When Tucker Carlson says that, or when the president gives cover to white supremacists, 
it makes the entire country unsafe. And I will tell you, having spoken with, I don't know how many hundreds of people since the attacks in El Paso, Dayton, and uh, in Gilroy, and actually I was down in Gilroy a couple of days afterwards, Jamal, after the uh, uh, domestic terrorist attack in Gilroy, and I could tell you, you have people, you know, of all communities and of all faiths who are afraid to leave their house to do basic things like shop, pick up their medicines, you know, take their kids to school, go to doctor's appointments, things like that. So we are letting a handful of people, whether it be Tucker Carlson, the president of the United States, a handful of white supremacists, you know, who are however many they are, are holding a country of over 320 million people, Jamal, hostage, because we cannot, and I will say this directly, it's really one person primarily, because Mitch McConnell doesn't have the strength, I was going to use another word, but we're on the radio, doesn't have the mental fortitude, let's say, to even bring this to the U.S. Senate for a debate. Let's, let's say that there's no vote. He is actually refusing, because the House passed a bill on universal background checks, and the Senate is waiting to take it up, Jamal. But Mitch McConnell, Moscow Mitch, is refusing to even let the greatest you know, body in the world, allegedly, of debate bring it to the floor for discussion. So well, this is the main issue. I mean, I mean, these politicians and members of the media who are basically covering up Crimes. the acts of white supremacists are more dangerous than these, uh, you know, killers. In my opinion, yeah, they have blood on their hands. When Absolutely. Mitch McConnell delays and 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 hides uh, whatever takes off when the country needs him to be a leader, to bring this to the floor of the Senate and let them decide on new regulations, you know, to control this insane amount of weapons that we have on the streets, he is basically supporting the killers. I yeah. Mean, I, I, can't, I can't think of any other way or when the President of the United States, you know, except for the last, I have to say, except for the last teleprompter speech for Donald Trump when he looks basically so phony re reading and for the very first time saying that there are white supremacists when he said, you know, there were good people on all sides when uh, people were shouting Jews want to replace us and, and, and you know, all these neo-Nazis marching in the streets. And by the way, this Tucker Carlson, this is not the first time he says something crazy like this. We know what he said about Iraqi people. Right. Remember? Right. We, we, we said that in another show. He also once said that uh, immigrants are making America poorer and dirtier and more divided. And he argued if you are a leader of Western civilization, you ought to believe it's superior to non-Western societies. These are, you can go actually to Google and Google his name and see all the insane incendiary and racist things he had basically spawned on the internet and on TV. It's, it's crazy it that, is. that and, actually he has uh, a platform to do so on Fox News. And by the way, you're listening to Arab Talk on KPOO in San Francisco. We're at 89.5 FM. We're streaming live on the KPOO website. And of course, these shows will be podcast Lot will be podcast later afterwards. You can go to Jamal's Facebook page where they'll be posted later. Jamal De, Jamal Dejani too, and then obviously you know you can check out our website ArabTalkRadio.com. So so these things bling, I just on this topic these things bring the best and the worst out of people. Just and of course I've been watching a lot of news, watching news right here in, in uh, Europe, and people are confused, they're being sympathetic, they're questioning why uh, American leaders are not doing something about it. I've been listening to politicians, I've been listening to pundits, but then again, I watch our networks like CNN News, and I said, this brings the best and the worst out of people, and then 
I was just like, just by chance watching Jake Tapper on his show. Why were you watching Jake Tapper, Jamal? Well, I was trying to keep up with what's going on in, in the U.S., so I was watching in, 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 in just by chance, basically, in less than a few hours after uh, the heinous terror attack in El Paso. And then he just go on a, he goes on a tangent, Jess, in a segment. This was on Sunday. And he basically says that he started comp- drawing Palestinians who are, as you know, the victims of Israeli aggression, occupation, and apartheid all in one. And he says that this is similar, like what's happening in the United States is similar to what happens with Palestinians' leaders. So the Palestinians and the way they talk about Israelis justifying in the same way you're doing, you know, no direct link between what the leader says and the violence to some poor Israeli girl in a pizzeria. Unbelievable. But the idea you're validating this hatred. So he draws, he's just basically saying, you know, he's trying to kind of compare President Trump and other politicians, you know, with their indifference telling people something and then they're not, you know, encouraging them, encouraging them to do something else. And of course, he has, you know, uh, you know, a panel with him, which is kind of like shamelessly they stood silent, and in they fact, didn't say anything. Except, no, except for uh, Santorum, you know, who chimes in and starts starts free associating and talking about Hamas. So here is a nation <laughs> mourning morning right in the United States and all of a sudden Jake Taper starts basically talking or 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 or, or uh, I would say uh, shilling for the Israeli lobby basically is basically basically to- saying apex talking points exactly and Israeli Hasbara when this country is in mourning and trying to score a political jab or something with something so removed 9,000 miles away from the incidents, you are now trying to draw in the victims of the Israeli occupation, aggression, you know, when Palestinians are killed on a daily basis, when children are dragged into jail or into interrogation rooms, when Israel killed thousands of people in Gaza, when their lands are getting confiscated on a daily basis. And guess what? He's saying they're somehow to blame. Well, but that's, the audacity. but that's it, Jamal. That's the classic, and that's, what, that's what's happening now. They're blaming victims. So what, what Jake Tapper's doing is blaming the victims of Israeli aggression and apartheid. But just like what is happening in this country with the Republican, with the Trump, with the Fox talking points, the problem is not white supremacy, Jamal. The problem is mental health, or the problem is video games, or the problem really, from what they're saying, is that we're, quote, being invaded, close quote, from, you know, Central America. That's the problem. So it's the classic blame the victim for the difficulties or the carnage that is happening now. Actually, a better association, Jamal, if Jake Tapper wanted to be really honest about it, there's a closer association between extreme white right wing white supremacy and uh, the policies of the Israeli government than anything else. I mean, you know, white supremacy ideology and, uh, you know, thinking that you, they are somehow better than indigenous people is the same kind of rhetoric and ideology that uh, well, the Israeli colonial settlement exactly or Israeli colonial settlers are white supremacists they are and, and, and but the difference is, is that they're proud you know they are uh, they're uh, proud of it yeah they're proud and they are there to basically usurp the land abuse the indigenous population 
because somehow they think that they are superior to the indigenous population. This is white supremacy. So whatever Jake Tapper is doing, whatever Tucker Carlson is doing, whatever Sean Hannity is doing, whatever Mitch McConnell is doing, and by the way, I have a new nickname for Mitch McConnell. You know, they called him Moscow Mitch because he refuses to bring to the floor of the Senate, Jamal, uh, any kind of discussion about uh, election reform, you know, making sure that we have free and fair elections in this country, free from international uh, interference. He refuses to bring that debate to the Senate. Because he's now refusing to bring the issue of background checks to the Senate floor, there's a new nickname for Mitch. We call him Machine Gun Mitch because he is advocating the same kind of horrific uh, policies that, you know, Sean Hannity is, which is, you know, he actually said, Jamal, there's no appetite for background check legislation in the U.S. Senate. When 94 percent of the, um, um, you know, the uh, population of this country believes in it. So we need to hold Mitch McConnell, the Republican Party, Donald Trump, all of these guys um, truly accountable. Now, what is the common feature, Mitch McConnell, Donald Trump, Sean Hannity, Tucker Carlson, what do they all have in common? Well, many things. <laughs> white supremacy is one. Well, I was just going to say, they're these like white dudes who are advocating for this racist, hateful ideology with their hands on the levers of power that won't even let debate happen in the people's house. That's what it's and, coming down to. Yeah, and, and also they do the dirty work for the NRA, and this is the and, sad thing. Yeah, and APAC. You know, you know just like APAC, uh, I always say you have the worst you know, lobby group in the United States and the most toxic in Washington, D.C., the NRA and APAC. Right. It's, it's both. It's all about basically the NRA, you know, controls all, all these and, and, and spends a lot of money, which, uh, you know, buying off votes. If you look, there is, uh, you know, you could look at, on, on a website and find how, how much each politician received from the NRA, you'll find the same politicians who receive money from APAC, they receive money from the NRA. It's I not a coincidence. I don't think there's a coincidence there. So, Jamal, I, I, we've only got, let's say, you know, 10, 15 minutes left. I want to make sure that I, I think we've, we've covered this, and I'm, I'm sad to say that I have no confidence that Mitch McConnell or the Republican Party is actually going to be able, or the Democrats for that matter, are going to be able to do anything to stop these mass murders. So I'm sorry to say that the people of the United States are going to be held hostage by these crazy white guys who are going to refuse to do anything to protect American citizens and people living in this country. Now, having said that, I think I just want to switch gears and maybe go internationally for a little bit, because buried in the headlines here, speaking of um, white supremacy and white nationalism and uh, indigenous people. India and uh, their prime minister has just decided to annex the portion of Kashmir that, uh, you know, basically India had agreed basically to, to you know, be essentially semi-autonomous on, on its own. For people who don't realize, there's basically three countries who basically regulate the borders and kind of maintain Kashmir's semi-independence and autonomy. So you have India, you have Pakistan, and actually China, very, very few people know this, monitor a small part of uh, Kashmir. But since 1339, Jamal, Kashmir has been a majority Muslim-ruled, you know, uh, territory and has, yeah. you know, has a long, rich, amazing history. And has always been a dispute. You know, here we go again. I mean, Kashmir has been fighting for its independence for, you know, since 1947. And, right. and India just decides, much like the Israelis are trying to do, Jamal, uh, 
we're just going to annex uh, our portion of, uh, of Kashmir. It's really an aggressive act which could destabilize the region pretty dramatically. Well, just uh, to add some uh, context to it, so what uh, the um, what India has done basically and is revoke or change. Uh, actually, they had the constitutional change, revoking Article 370 of in the India's constitution, strips Kashmiris of exclusive rights to buy property and hold certain government position allowing outsiders to influence laws and own part of the of the land of Kashmir. So Indian administered Kashmir can no longer fly its own flag. It, it's very similar to what the Israelis have done in Area C after That's right. the old Oslo agreement. That's right. And, resi- and, and re- of the West, Area C of the West Bank. And residents fear the measures could, could uh, upend their customs and cultures. And this is, of course, came... Uh, by, uh, through a speech by Modi, uh, who blamed Article 370 for what he described as widespread corruption and nepotism in Kashmir and other things. So he just basically deployed tens of thousands of troops overnight, has arrested more than 500 people. Right. Uh, uh, you know, the, basically the, the leadership, including local politicians, leaders, and outspoken members, uh, outspoken Kashmiris, Kashmiris uh, schools and shops uh, have closed. And in order to prevent uh, any unrest, the government also stopped the flow of information in Kashmir. So we're not really getting everything out of there. We don't know what's going on. These are tidbits that we know. 500 people have been arrested. You don't know. So uh, they shut down the internet, Jess. They yeah, cut they shut down. Yeah. They cut off phones and, and, and the internet. cable TV. And local uh, news websites uh, are frozen in time. So, so if you go to some of the local networks there, you'll just see the, they haven't updated their pages. They're frozen in time since late Sunday or Monday morning. And so we are not really getting the full story. In fact, Modi today had a speech uh, talking about the reasons behind it and whatever. But it is, um, I, you, you said this could be, this could spark a war between two nuclear powers, Pakistan and India. So it's more danger, dangerous and more destabilizing than it looks. I think that's right, Jamal, because what Pakistan has decided to do is call an emergency session of their governing bodies. They've stopped uh, trans-Indo-Pakistani trade. They've recalled the diplomatic mission from uh, Mumbai back to Pakistan. So things are very tense right now. Uh, they down they downgraded its diplomatic ties with India, and it 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 hasn't done so. But they they, they said that they will they would expel India's ambassador. So this is really I mean I, it's not making the news because of the crazy 24-hour internet news cycle that we have here in this country. But people need to know that in terms of a destabilizing force. We have a big one now between India and Pakistan, as you said, two nuclear powers. So um, I want to make sure that we also, you know, and we'll, you know, we'll continue to monitor this situation. But the other thing that was kind of interesting is this really um, disturbing piece of news I read and I want you to report on having to do with this crazy docudrama uh, uh craziness that the Israeli, uh, an Israeli film crew and the Israeli police somehow colluded on something. When I read the story, Jamal, I didn't believe it. So maybe you can shed some light on this. Yeah, and, and, and the other thing is no one is reporting on this in the States. This is actually a big, a big story in Israeli media and in Palestinian media and then some Arab sites, but I haven't seen it played. So what's like the for sto- example? What's the so, story? So basically, in the course of a TV series on the Jerusalem police force, you know, just like those uh, 
shows that we have on our TV about cops. Oh yeah, you know, right. arresting people and DUI and and what have you. I'm sure you saw, you saw a few minutes of those, which I find them crazy shows, uh, frankly. Uh, so they they have a similar show about uh, the Jerusalem police force. So this is what the producers of the of the TV series, and this is in in cahoots with uh, Israel's police force. They planted a weapon in the house of a Jerusalemite Palestinian and then documented its discovery. The, the story broke in Haaretz. I mean, this poor guy, his name is Samer Sliman, who is from the village of Isawiyya, you know, that's a suburb of, uh, of Jerusalem. And this is not, uh, you know, this is not a new story. Now they just found the footage of it. This actually, uh, the story happened in 2018, Jess. 2018? Yeah, because, you know, they, they shoot in advance and then they release, you know, they shot this story. So so in, in they searched his house in 2018. And then, uh, then after they searched his house, by the way, he wasn't arrested. He wasn't arrested? Uh, no, no, he was harassed and his child was, uh, they destroyed basically his house and because they knew they were lying and, and they're just making this up. And then, um, and they, they said they found nothing. But then, a few months later, this Palestinian was watching the show because, you know, Palestinians also watch Israeli TV. Right. And they, they watch you know, they, they are bilingual, they speak Arabic, Hebrew, etc. So they're watching, and this neighbor of his, and he was watching the show, and all of a sudden he sees his neighbor, he was able to identify his house, the man's house in the episode. episode. This is a nine-part docudrama called Jerusalem District, it translates to Jerusalem District, which airs on Khan TV, KN TV. The episode records a search for weapons in the course of which uh, a cellar is discovered, described by one of the series' main characters as a tunnel, which would do credit to be, you know, which would do credit to the ones found in Gaza. <laughs> so that, this is how they create this thing here. In the cellar, it was actually Suleiman's house. They find an M16, uh, M16 rifles, not one, M16 rifles. They're found there. And the policemen in the documentary appear overjoyed at finding these guns, leaving the village satis satisfied with their work. However, Suleiman was unexpectedly not arrested or questioned about the allegedly found weapon. Suleiman's son Saleh was shot five years ago with a sponge tip bullet fired by the police and it actually damaged his eye. And anyway, I'm just reading some of, of the notes. His neighbors, they're just in shock watching and say, oh, we didn't know that you had weapons and you were arrested, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so the whole, I'm mean, talking about a hoax, which is a sick hoax. Yeah, that's the hoax. was a real sick hoax. Yeah. In order to make money and to get more viewers and fame and whatever, both the Israeli police and the producers and the TV stations they make up this lie about this poor guy, raid his house in the middle of the uh, in the night on the premise that they were looking for weapons, plant a weapon, and make a story about that they uncovered this terrorist there. Yeah, that sounds like a, 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 not just a tragedy, Jamal, but that story built on a lie is basically the story of Israeli Hasbara boiled down into another, you know, single moment where you have collusion between the media and the military making up these crazy hoaxes stories in order to justify aggressive militaristic occupation uh, policies against an indigenous population. So in some ways I'm shocked, but in a weird way, I'm actually not surprised. This is part of the Israeli handbook, isn't it? part of the Israeli handbook, part of the Israeli Hasbara, 
And uh, of course, they left the evidence. Yes, this is a joke because it was all caught on tape. So the tape, <laughs> the real tape that was unedited, showed them planting the weapon. And this is the statement, by the way, by Slayman. They came to his house just at 3:30 in the morning. A border policemen surrounded his house, armed, came with a sledgehammer. You know, knocked off his door, accompanied by dogs entered terrified his children there you know they came with dogs and told them to all sit on the floor had his children sit uh, on the floor put put his child sitting with a dog near his face one of the dogs damaged you know the place like biting things and, and looking pretending to look for things and then of course in the process they planted the m16s and they said they uncovered a terrorist cell and played it on TV. Well, uh, what can I tell you, Jamal? That's part, that's a classic Israeli Hasbara story, and there's probably more. So we have some good news for our Arab Talk listeners, Jamal, that you will be back in studio next week, so we'll be able to report, uh, although this has actually been a very effective way of doing the show because we get the international perspective as well as literally the international perspective because you're reporting live from uh, Europe right now. But we're looking forward to having you back in studio next week. I'm looking forward to it. It's uh, actually great to travel abroad. As you know, we've done many reports. We've done reports from Palestine. And we've done reports from... Everywhere. <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> Egypt, <laughs> Libya, right. Tunisia, you name it. Right. Okay, well, listen, uh, we want to thank our listeners again. You can listen to this show uh, on our website at once it's podcasted at arabtalkradio.com. Check out Jamal's Facebook page with all of our shows, which is Jamal Dejani 2, and check out our SoundCloud account, also Arab Talk Radio. Thanks so much, and Jamal, we'll see you back in studio next week. See you next week. Okay.